And then uh, finally, at least in this step, we have uh, the deployment. So um, we have the, it basically binds literally the release networks, uh, resource pools, uh, has some settings about the compilation workers, which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Uh, has a list of the jobs that we actually are deploying. Uh, some settings about the actual concurrency or the parallelism that we're going to be using in the deployment itself. Because I think it varies depending on what you're updating at the time and how many instances of each component you have. Uh, some properties that you will actually be passing in into the templates that we provided before. And then finally some extensions into the actual things we provided to the IS layer. Um, so let's actually take a look at the, I guess, the sample deployment. So uh, again, it's a little hard to see, but at the very top we have a name of the deployment. Uh, below that we have the release and the release version that we're targeting. So it's very important. Um, I mean, it, there's a lot of, I guess, just checking to make sure, sanity checking to make sure that all these things already exist before you actually perform any kind of uh, mutable steps. Uh, the compilation uh, workers is basically the step where we talked about actually preparing the source bits. So when we took Redis, I mean, have the Redis source, and we go and compile it into the actual target environment. This basically describes the parallelism of those compilations or preparations taking place. Because in some environments we have an unbounded amount of resources, in other environments we might be limited by you know an instance count. So we might want to control that. Um, below that we have the update section. So we have this concept of uh, canaries. So the canary in the coal mine. Um, we want to make sure that if we're going to do an update of 100 um, application servers, we don't want to do 10 at a time and start for the first first 10 and then break them all because of the configuration issue. We actually start with the very first one. And we watch it for a little longer. So an example here, the canary watch time is set to 60 seconds. So we deploy the very first one, we watch it for 60 seconds. If it's so healthy after that, then we go in with the rest and the setting in this configuration file is four and we'll do four at a time at a much uh, lower interval. So in this case, by half, so 30 seconds. That's kind of an important concept because if we fail, we want to fail fast, but also with the most minimal amount of impact. So this canary approach actually has been very uh, important for us. Uh, the network section, I mean, it's not really that interesting, but I mean, it basically describes, in this case, this was deployed on vSphere, so we have a lot of explicit network configurations, and at the very end, we have the port group or VLAN that we bound this to. Uh, in the AWS case, we use uh, vSphere dynamic network, so pretty much all of these settings are, are blank. And then if you have a uh, VIP or Elastic IP-like network, again, most of this is blank, you just specify the IPs that you want to use. Um, in uh, AWS, we also had options for security groups and other things. So the very last line, the cloud properties, is important because it lets us customize and take advantage of the features provided by the infrastructure as a service, and like OpenStack or uh, vSphere or uh, AWS, and extend it and consume some of those things that are not available on other platforms. So that's actually really important uh, to take advantage of those things. Continuing down, we have uh, resource pools, and again, uh, something similar. So we have a name of a resource pool, we want to make sure that we don't define the random VM sizes per job. We want to have consistency as a whole. We don't want to manage, you know, four VMs with, you know, 384 megs of RAM, five with, you know, uh, you know, 512, one with something else. So we actually want to define all of our VMs up front. So we actually have a consistent picture of these things. Um, and this actually fits in pretty well with, again, different types of infrastructure. So for vSphere, where we have a lot of options for um, different uh, configurations of RAM, disk, and CPU, and then for uh, AWS, we had a more of a limitation of just choosing an instance type. And this kind of fits in really well into the model. Uh, and again, it binds the stem cell. So if we want to use, uh, create one resource pool with a Windows stem cell, a different uh, resource pool with a Linux stem cell, we can do that too. So the system uh, is pretty flexible. Now we're getting to the, I guess, more interesting section. We have uh, the job list here. So one of the things I didn't mention earlier is that release is fully, I guess, you can have a lot of jobs and packages, but it doesn't mean you actually have to go and deploy all of these components. So let's say you have, uh, in this case, we have a WordPress server, and if WordPress supported Postgres, for instance, you can actually have Postgres inside the release, but if you don't list it in this section, we're not going to be deploying it. And it's kind of important because uh, you might want to have a much bigger uh, choice or a bag of jobs and packages you can deploy, but in, in reality, when you go to your actual installation, you might want to just deploy a subset or a slightly different configuration of it. Uh, if we go from the very top, uh, it has the MySQL job, uh, we have both a name section and a template. So we can actually in instantiate multiple jobs from a single template. And by template, I mean what we saw or defined earlier with the, the Redis job and also the, the, I think the video was just the Redis job, sorry. Um, moving on, we have the number of instances. So for MySQL, we're not using a replicated configuration, so it's just a single master. Um, we have an infrastructure resource pool, so we're consuming something defined in the previous section. Uh, next option is actually kind of important, so it's a persistent disk. So 
everything up to now is kind of assumed that all the components are completely stateless. Right? So when you have stateless components, it's easy to do updates, everything's great. Uh, but we, uh, we know that we have a lot of data that's also very important. So persistent disk is something that we, um, it's a convention that we use to basically not a volume that's completely disconnected from the base uh, system itself into a concrete location inside the guest. And then we can figure all of our components to store all the data in that one location. And when we do certain updates, like updating the kernel, we basically detach the disk with the persistent data, uh, delete the old VM. So in some cases, we um, copy and write clones, so we don't want to write too much the, the data to the, the base disk. And then uh, instantiate the VM from the new template. Uh, we attach the persistent disk, uh, download the new MySQL binary or the old MySQL binary or whatever else is there, and then basically start it back up with, uh, while maintaining the old data. So it, it, it buys us a lot of flexibility. For everything else, if they don't have a persistent disk section, that means we can actually destroy that component without losing any data. So it's kind of a very important contract that we have uh, with the system, and it keeps ourselves honest of making sure that we don't pollute the, the various uh, system with lots of data all over the place. So it's kind of this. Um, moving on, we have the number section. So for MySQL, we actually are assuming a static IP because if it was a dynamic IP, we would uh, not be able to find it. Um, later on, we're going to be using, we actually have support for DNS in the system. That basically we have a, a power DNS server running within the environment that uh, provides basically location of some of these components automatically so we can get rid of some of these uh, uh, network settings. Uh, for WordPress, it's very similar. It doesn't have a persistent disk. That means that WordPress servers can actually be, uh, with application servers can be recycled. There's no data there. All the data is stored in the MySQL server above. And there's actually four instances. So below you can see there's a range defined for the static IPs from 30 to 33. And each one will go uh, to the uh, according instance. The very uh, last section is basically the property. So this defines all the customization you want for the deployment. So in this case, there's an admin user, there's a port, there's a list of all the application servers and their IPs, there's a server name, uh, there's some credentials for the database, and a bunch of uh, credentials for, uh, I'm assuming, some kind of WordPress settings. I haven't actually uh, taken a look at the, uh, the templates themselves. But again, this is very application specific, and if the jobs basically uh, provided a way to templatize the configurations, this is exactly, this is where you plug in the actual raw values. And just to do a recap of, uh, again, the tool that we, that we created. So uh, the very first step where you would, as a developer, you would do is Bosch target, and you provide an endpoint of the Bosch instance. Uh, what we call it here is a director. Uh, and I'll talk with the components later and how they kind of interact together. Uh, the, the very first time, well, whenever you're actually updating the kernel of the system or the Linux image, you want to upload the stem cell. So we have a path to the stem cell, and we upload it once. We go into our sample release or whatever the application, whether it's Scott Foundry, WordPress, or pick your application. Um, you go into that release, uh, you call Bosch create release, which basically creates a new release turbo for you. Uh, you now upload it after that to the director. After that, you set the deployment, basically specifying all of the settings we saw earlier. You uh, actually want to edit the deployment to uh, update the, the version of the release you just built, or maybe upload, update the version of the stem cell that you uploaded. And then finally, you watch deploy. And that one bird performs any kind of update in the system, whether you're scaling up, scaling down, upgrading, uh, rolling back, uh, updating the system kernel, it doesn't really matter. That one bird does all of the, the updates. And that's kind of important because we don't want to educate all the engineers on our, uh, on our team, basically, for this kind of update, please do this, for this, do that. It's a really nice tool that kind of does everything. So, uh, I really want to talk about the, the contracts. I kind of just, uh, briefly gloss uh, over them before. So we have a lot of assumptions and a lot of um, uh, a lot of conventions in the system and we heavily rely on them. So for the jobs, for instance, I said that we rely on Monit today. So if you try to, if you don't configure Monit and try to sort things on your own, we're not gonna be able to shut things down or sort things up or train them the way that we think we can. Uh, for releases, again, we describe our releases in the release repository. So if you don't have your source inside of that release repo and you don't use the source and sub-module pointers that we use today to maintain uh, the objects or use the logs for the large objects, uh, it's, it's not going to work as well. So I mean, nothing is going to prevent you from doing app get or yum or whatever install in your configuration files, but it kind of breaks a lot of the, the things that we rely on. Um, in the cloud provider interface, I'll, I'll talk about the 10 methods uh, really soon, but it's only really those 10 methods. We don't want to rely on too many more methods than that because it gives us the flexibility of deploying th things. We can have a development instance on you know, AWS, we can have a staging instance on OpenStack, and we can have a production instance on vSphere or any one of the combinations. 
And again, it gives us the flexibility of doing that as long as we uh, keep our contract very simple at this layer. If we try to complicate it too much, then we're going to lose the flexibility of deploying on, on various infrastructures. Uh, going back to control, so uh, for design principle, when we designed this, we really wanted to have repeatable deployments. So if I do a deployment and something fails, and it happens actually relatively frequently, whether it was an issue with a component of the system, whether it was a hardware error, or it was just you know, a timeout that basically fired or, or, uh, or didn't fire, um, it's really important that when something fails, you can actually recover from that point and actually continue. So one of the, the way we actually designed the system was to, it was based on kind of eventual consistency. And I mean, I know a lot of people say that, but in our case, we minimize the state that we store in our own database. We have a tiny Postgres database that we use ourselves. But uh, it's more described in the deployment manifest of all the options and all the settings. It's very explicit there. There's a lot of data you might ask, you know, why do you need everything in there? But it's important to us actually describing exactly what we want the system to be like. Then we go out to the existing system that's already deployed and we ask it, what are you currently doing? And we ask each individual VM concurrently and we gather and we're scouting gather all the, the answers. And then we compare it to what we actually expect the system to be doing from the deployment manifest. So then we apply the differences only to the components that are out of sync with what we want them to be doing. So it's kind of similar to some of the other approaches out there. But the nice thing is if something fails, so let's say you're doing a deployment and you have a thousand VMs and you got through 500 and all of a sudden, I don't know, you got a pickup somewhere, right? So the thing failed. At that point, we don't want to be stranded, right? I mean, we don't want to go in and manually go and fix things. We actually just want to do box deploy again. And then it understands. It scatters and gathers, gets half the answers from the correct ones on the new version. And it's like, okay, you're good. We don't need to look at you anymore. And then it takes a second half and performs the update from there. So it's a really nice property to have to have these uh, repeatable deployments. And also, it's one of those things where we can do these deployments at any, any a dev environment, a staging environment, a production environment. It's all the same. It's really, really important. Regarding the predictable rollout. so. One of the things I, I kind of moved away from talking about, about dependencies. So all the dependencies in our system, especially when we're talking about runtime dependencies, are explicitly defined in the deployment manifest. So in the job section, it's actually an array. So it's a sorted array. So if you basically define something to be first, it's going to be the first thing that's deployed. If it's defined to be last, then it's the last thing deployed. That's really important. Again, you have thousands or hundreds or whatever, how big your deployment is. Uh, you don't want to be surprised when you do the deployment and all of a sudden it starts updating your application server before the, your, your database migration or whatever the, the requirements are. So we're very, very explicit with our uh, order. And it's, again, defining the deployment manifest. So consistency is also very important. I kind of talked a little bit about this, but again, we want to be able to have uh, a developer on our team or anyone's team basically being able to uh, create a release deployed on their own tiny instance or wherever, it doesn't matter whether it's running on OpenStack or, or AWS. And then uh, later on, provide it to the, the operations or the site reliability team and say, hey, this is blessed, you know, it's good to go, I've verified everything works. And it kind of moves into this nice cycle. So basically an engineer gives it off to the operations team, the operations team can go and test it in staging and then finally roll it off to production or whatever the, the, the life cycle is. But having that consistency of sharing objects and having exactly the same way of deploying these various pages uh, and Bosch is inherently um, aware of being able to support multiple destinations and multiple targets. So I kind of showed it in the usage uh, slide before, but you can do a Bosch target, you know, dev one, and you know, target the, the, your dev environment number one. And then later on, you can do Bosch target staging, and it'll target the staging environment, and you can do the same operations there. Yeah, different credentials, different endpoints, but again, the operations and the verbs are all the same. It doesn't matter whether it's dev staging or production. Okay, we're getting uh, some more interesting things, a little more technical. So. Um, so these are all the components that make up the, the Bosch uh, system today. So I kind of use Bosch and Director interchangeably, but it's kind of the API uh, endpoint for the system. And instead of going through the, the rest of these things, I'll just pull up the, kind of the interaction slide a little more pretty. Um, so most of the user, every user, basically uses the Bosch side on the left-hand side. Uh, it uses the rest endpoint provided by the Director. The director is a, kind of a simple Ruby process that uh, talks uh, through Redis to the workers. And it uses Rescue, for those of you familiar with it. Uh, all of the work is done in these uh, asynchronous workers. Um, we use NATS, which is a simple message bus, uh, for communication between the, the workers and uh, the agents running inside the VMs. And the workers themselves, I know it's a simple box, but it's actually running inside the workers. But it, and that's where all of the, the commands to the underlying infrastructure take place. So it's very important that, um, again, that the system uh, uh, behaves this way. We have a couple of things. Like I said, we have a Postgres database, very minimal update or data size for your production is in order of megabytes, uh, if not less than that. 
And then we have the health monitor that does some health uh, heart beating in the system to make sure that the VM goes away. Uh, we actually know about it, so that's that doesn't work. And again, this guy shows uh, uh, once you're done after the deploying these things, these are your active jobs and the various disks that are attached to them. So now, um, I want to briefly talk about the, I guess, the cloud provider, the provider interface, or the CPI. So when I said it's 10 methods, I really mean like these are the 10 methods. And if you guys should take a look at them, these are really you know, straightforward. I mean, they're kind of self-explanatory. I mean, we can go through them in the Q&A section later on. But I mean, the first two methods have to deal with creating and uh, deleting uh, VM templates. So we do it in a image and image it. The next uh, group of four methods have to do with these basic uh, VM uh, operations, so creating, deleting, rebooting, and possibly configuring networks. Some of these uh, some of these methods are even options. So if you don't implement them, it's okay. It tries to use a different way of actually performing some of the operations. Uh, and then towards the very end, we have four methods dealing with persistent disks. So uh, this is one area where we might need to do a little more extension or a little more customization for some kind of flavors or because um, <coughs> in the areas above, we have room for cloud properties, basically things that are extended from the deployment manifest. The disk is one area that we don't. But it, it's an a easy thing to extend to uh, support you know, multiple uh, volumes, possibly rating things, and, and uh, things of that sort. But again, what is the locality parameter? Sure, so the, the question was, what's the locality parameter? So again, it's one of the optimizations. So when we create a disk and we know which VM we're going to be attaching it to later, we don't want to go create in the wrong availability zone, the wrong cluster, wrong storage. Uh, right? So we want to create it as close as we can to that VM so we don't have to move it later on. So if you do have uh, a VM, for instance, then you want to attach a disk that lives in a different um, uh, availability zone or cluster or whatever the underlying storage array is, uh, we'll actually move it for you. But again, that move is expensive, so we want to minimize uh, those kind of operations. So we, we do, okay, so today we support uh, start and stop uh, for, for Java. But before we do that, we, we do notify them that you're about to be stopped. And that operation is customizable to the point of you can actually say, I need the next five minutes to stop, I need the next one hour to stop, or however, however time you need to, to take that operation. Within there, it's completely up to you what you do at that point. So if you want to basically shut down and drain your connections and basically keep running, that's fine. Um, if you want to immediately stop because you have nothing to lose, if it gets shut down immediately, that's also uh, an option. Um, beyond that, we don't really have anything else that's more advanced. But for Cloud Foundry today, which is we have all sorts of components in the system, we have things like RabbitMQ, uh, Postgres, My, MySQL. Uh, uh, we have NFS servers in there, so we have lots of uh, various components. It actually works pretty well. I mean, there's a few areas where it's not ideal, and we're trying to fix it, but for the most part, it works pretty well. And then I just have one more slide before we get to the QA part. But so when I said that the CPI is pretty much uh, the only thing you have to implement to support uh, a new infrastructure as a service, like again, or infrastructure like OpenStack, um, there's one other place again when I talked about earlier is the agent infrastructure point. So while well, if we implement you know all the create calls, the delete calls, and that's great, but the problem is we still need to bootstrap the VM itself. And also we can't upload the you know the vSphere stem cell into you know OpenStack, at least I'm not aware of anyone consuming. Well maybe there are, I guess, ESX uh, hypervisor providers. But for the most part, if you have a KVM hypervisor, we have to create a custom stem cell for KVM. If you're using Zen, we might be able to use the same uh, stem cell that we're using for AWS, but we might need to customize it slightly to uh, whatever if the format's slightly different. Also for bootstrapping for um, for AWS, we use the uh, instance metadata server. So I know there's one similar for uh, for uh, OpenStack, so we might be able to take advantage of that. If not, then we have to uh, slightly tune that to, uh, to support that as well. The very last bullet points I just wanted to briefly touch on it was, so we actually eat our own dog food, so Bosch can actually be used to deploy Bosch itself. I mean, as you saw on the infrastructure slide, that we have you know, seven or eight components, and if you have it deployed by hand, which we used to do for quite some time, it's not very funny. Either. So we actually have a special plugin into the uh, CLI that actually calls out to the cloud for only your own local machine and basically calls the same, same similar commands to basically deploy a really sim simple Bosch deployer. And from there, you can actually go and deploy a much bigger system. So it's, it's a little bit of an exception there. And maybe we don't try to say that because it confuses people, but it, it, it's kind of nice with uh, how it works. So we can talk about that uh, later.